Uh, and we are joined now by a man who now has the uh, unusual, uh, uh, I guess, part of his political history is that the Prime Minister called him an arrogant uh, prick, which I don't think he is. Uh, and I'm sure he doesn't think he is. Uh, David Seymour, it wasn't what we wanted to talk to you about, but let's get the uh, elephant out of the room first. Um, <laughs> I've got to say, and I've done politics and watched Parliament for quite some time, while it seems small... It is. It feels distasteful to me the use of that language against another member inside the chamber. Yeah, well, it's, it's something I haven't seen much of, and I was pretty surprised to hear it uh, from Jacinda Ardern, who, you know, some people will will disagree and be surprised to hear, but I, I've always thought is, you know, fundamentally a good person. My my criticisms of her have not been that she's not well-meaning more that she um, doesn't really know how to help people uh, w even though she may want to um, and yet uh, I guess the irony is that uh, I was asking her at the time has she ever made a mistake properly apologized then fixed it uh, she couldn't give an answer the best answer she could give was MIQ which would be a surprise to a lot of people who suffered through that um, uh, and now I have got her to apologize for something but I think the apologies we really want are for rising prices and ram raids and trying to use the treaty to divide New Zealand in half all right uh, and we are actually in, for in fact talking to um, grounded Kiwis a little later and we, we dealt yesterday with this issue that it would seem to me an apology for the pain, the doubtless pain, pain and upset caused by our MIQ policies, which the Ombudsman has suggested were wrong and wrong-headed. It would seem to me there is no legal um, liability created by the Prime Minister simply acknowledging that pain by way of apology. Well, you'd think so, but it seems they've taken a strategy throughout COVID of never apologise, never explain, always deflect. And you saw that in the case of Charlotte Ballas, uh, the woman who was pregnant, <laughs> sheltering with the Taliban, uh, that, that great feminist powerhouse uh, in the world. Uh, and um, yet, uh, you know, the only time that she got an apology uh, was when it was clear that legal action was going to require one. So finally, after leaking her private details, which was itself uh, a major transgression, um, you know, she got an apology from Chris Hipkins for that. Large, uh, you know, their strategy is deflect, deny, uh, and, and crash through. And uh, I think that is why perhaps yesterday's incident uh, got a lot of attention. Yeah. Uh, you did get an apology by text, I understand? Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, I got a text from the Prime Minister who said, look, you know, apologies, shouldn't have said it. My mum says if you have nothing to say, don't say anything. Uh, and I just said, well, that's, that's fine. And Merry Christmas. Hope you have a good one. Which is, I guess, amongst adults, the way things roll, right? Um, so oh, I think it's the key, I think it's I think it's the Kiwi way, and I've, there's been a lot of international interest because, of course, they have been uh, fitting our prime minister, um, perhaps wrongly because they don't have to live under her policies. They've been fitting her for for years, um, and I was trying to explain to some foreign journalists it's the Kiwi way. I mean, look, she said sorry, it's no harm, no foul. We we move on. Who's around? Is it? Yeah, uh, you might bump into her at the gallery party tonight, David. Well, you never know. <laughs> All right, let's get on to what we wanted to talk about. And a story, to be honest, that I take, and the folk at the platform here take some little, no little pride in having help kick along. The issue of Nanaia Mahuta and the labyrinth of family uh, company connections to portfolios she has been or is associated with. The Public Service Commission came out with a report yesterday which only had limited you know, sort of terms of reference into what it could look into. Um, and I think this investigation prompted by, at the request of Mahuta herself in an attempt to cover her ass. Um, but the Public Service Commission has concerns over the way the Ministry for the Environment um, um, and uh, Te Puna Kokori ordered or, or dealt with conflicts of interest or perceived conflicts of interest, and a perceived conflict of interest is a conflict of interest, in regards to a guy called William Gannon Ormsby, who was the minister's husband, and a couple of um, companies he was involved with. First, have you read the report? Do you agree with its findings? Uh, well, no, I haven't read the report. I've had someone that has read it give me a briefing on it. And what I'd say is this. Um, 
first of all, you, know, you have to say if they've followed the right procedures that the Cabinet Manual sets out for every other minister for centuries, uh, then you know, you've know you got to say that that's above board. Uh, and it seems that in each case except one, uh, they can actually say that. Uh, I'd put two points to people. First is the appointment of her niece while she was the Associate Minister for the Environment. That was a clear breach of the Cabinet Manual and we've pointed that out repeatedly, uh, but the Government as so often the case with the Nāmahu to Jacinda Ardern doesn't bring any consequences for that. Um, the second thing I'd say is that I think even if you agree, if you accept that these appointments were done by the book in a country where there's not many people and, of course, there's always going to be conflicts and they have to be managed, I mean, if you just can just hold your breath and accept that, even then, my question is what are all these contracts delivering? Uh, because there's at least one of them, uh, which was thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars, that didn't deliver any kind of written output. And I think the real issue is that this government is hiring people all over the show who don't actually do much and wasting huge amounts of money. Uh, we've just found the tip of the iceberg because Nanaya Mahuta always seems to be just one and a half steps removed from it. Uh, this is funny. It actually links into something Nicola Willis said earlier on the programme. And that is this government has spent an awful lot of money without much discernible output in many cases, without KPIs and without strategic goals that have been set for the, that expenditure to work towards. Yeah, and look, you look at the big picture. This government inherited spending um, of in the 70s of billions. Pre-COVID 2019, it spent $87 billion. At that time, we said, gee, that's a lot of money. Uh, Post-COVID, even when COVID's all supposedly done and dusted and the response is over and there's no more wage subsidies or any of the other reasons that they like to give for spending, after all of that, they're going to be spending $128 billion. So they're up $41 billion, nearly a 50% increase in expenditure from pre-COVID periods. And if you want uh, kids going to school, are the police stopping ram raiders? Uh, are we seeing hospitals with enough staff to actually treat people in a timely manner? Is mental health being dealt to better than before this government came in? No, 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 and no. And in no case can they actually point to getting results uh, for this. And, and I think part of the reason is that they shell money out uh, at these contracts, which I, I'm not sure what, if anything, useful has been delivered for, from any of these Mahuta-associated uh, contracts. Well, if you're running a gravy train, there's got to be some gravy uh, around, David, would be, would be my observation on that. Um, I also want to raise with you the issue we talked with Nicola Willis about $750 million, give or take a, uh, a few tens of millions, who cares, on the TVNZ RNZ merger, and increasingly it looks like that policy will be a sacrificial lamb in order to virtue signal fiscal restraint by the government. What are you hearing about that, and do you care? Oh, well, I care enormously about hundreds of millions of dollars, and I care about a policy that appears designed to politicise the media. I mean, you had Willie Jackson interviewing Jack Tame, saying to Jack Tame, you must do this, you know, you, your company is responsible, you're responsible for your company. Uh, and this is a guy who's the Minister of Broadcasting, who wants to have a much bigger role over this supposed new merged entity and he actually thinks that somehow the interviewer in the chair like you are right now uh, is responsible for the company and responsible to the company not responsible to their audience and the seeking of truth uh, so i care about that that's one that's regardless of money that's a reason for it to stop uh, but we've also said repeatedly in recent weeks and months uh, there is so much pressure on people having to tighten their belts and firms and families and households and yet the government can't even say I mean, let, let's just accept for a moment we thought it was a good idea, just for a moment. Why wouldn't they say this is not, we'll put it back two years, take pressure off government spending, take pressure off mortgage rates until we get over the hump? Uh, so, But they haven't even been prepared to do that yet. So I hope it's dead. Nicola Willis certainly is saying everything she can to, to say that it's dead. But as we've seen with Three Waters, this government will crash through some of the craziest, most politically and policy, uh, you know, nonsensical policies that you, that you can imagine. Uh, so look, I, I'll believe it when I see it. These guys, uh, just because it's stupid 
referendum doesn't make sense doesn't mean that the Labor government won't do it. It would seem, David, would it not, that three waters and entrenchment or not, um, which was a bit of a dog's breakfast, three waters seems to be the one thing that this administration will not back, back down on. It's changed its tune on so many things, including more lately a recognition their immigration settings were crazy. Why do you think it is that three waters is the policy that shall not die? They will not, excuse the pun, pull the plug on that one. <laughs> well, well, the answer is the same answer I've been giving all year. Uh, three waters is not an infrastructure policy. It is a treaty settlement disguised as an infrastructure policy. Uh, for Nanaia Mahuta and the Māori Caucus, this is about control of assets. And you see it in the co-government of the representation bodies. Uh, you see it in the Te Mana o Te Wai statements. You see it in the expansion from three waters to five, including the sea and the geothermal power. These are very valuable assets. And if you have the obligation to be consulted on everything that happens, as you would in a Te Mana o Te Wai statement, over that asset, uh, then that is very, very valuable. And that it's just, I mean, I, I, I hate to accuse people of this, but what other explanation possibly makes sense? All right. Do you think it is also an indication of the power of the Māori caucus and the Labour Party? Well, I think that the Labour Party are already operating a form of co-government model. Uh, it seems that a minority of MPs, about 15, uh, seem to have the ability to wrap the rest of the government up like a pretzel, and you saw it over the three waters entrenchment. It was clearly wrong. The Cabinet had decided not to do it. Nanaia Mahuta got advice a month before the vote. Uh, she went to the House and said it was a moral obligation to vote for something that Cabinet had decided not to do. Uh, she denied that she'd had advice. Then last night she snuck into the House and made what's called a personal explanation where she stood up and said actually her answers in question time were wrong. She had had advice. All of this behaviour. Helen Clark would have had her sacked before she even got home. Unfortunately, under Jacinda Ardern, uh, you know, and presumably, I mean, the, the, the power of the Maori caucus is the only remaining explanation for why this behaviour is tolerated, even when it threatens the very constitutional basis of New Zealand. I had missed this thing last night. Could we just go back over that? So she came into the House last night and said, well, it's a personal statement is like, I'm just admitting I lied, isn't it? That's, the, that's what it really is. Uh, it's a, it's a, it is. I mean, I'd be cautious about saying that. But well, you would be, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I don't have yeah, to say. You can parliament. say it. I, I'm, I'm, bo I'm bound by the rules of Parliament, but you're not. So you can say whatever you like. But okay. um, look, um, it, basically, yesterday in question time, Simon Watts, the North Shore MP, and, and a little bit of me too, actually, were asking Mahuta questions uh, about whether or not she'd received advice on entrenchment uh, on the day that the uh, SOP was released. Mm. Uh, and she tried to say in question time, I, 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 she didn't answer the question. She was asked four different times in four different ways. She said, oh, I got other advice, but she never denied she got that advice. Um, then she came into the house later that day, which at seven o'clock after the dinner break, and said, actually, um, I did receive advice on the day about the entrenchment clause. So th this whole idea that it was a mistake, um, it, you know, it, it's not a mistake. And I, I asked her, was it a mistake or was it a moral obligation? Because she said in the, ha in the mm. house at the time it was a moral obligation to vote for entrenchment. And she said yesterday it was, oh, it was a mistake. Well, it clearly wasn't because even on that day, uh, she was getting advice about that amendment. So the idea that she hadn't been thinking about it She'd had it beforehand. She got advice on that day. She was constantly getting advised about this entrenchment issue. She went into the House and said it was a moral obligation to vote for it. She knew it wasn't government policy because Cabinet had already decided that. Uh, and yet, somehow, uh, she seems to keep getting away with it. It's just astonishing. And it shows the standards of Jacinda Ardern. But, hey, look, look at what Trevor Mallard got away with. You know, and look how he was rewarded off to Ireland for a plum job. Uh, you look at David Clark, went mountain biking in the middle of his own lockdown. I mean, you know, this, this is unfortunately is the standards under Jacinda Ardern. Um, and would you say that the continuing occupation of a cabinet post by Nanaya Mahuta is the apex of your concern or, or is the single starkest example of the problems? 
look, it's, it's an example uh, because it shows when push comes to shove, um, you know, the Labour Party is not able to govern for New Zealand, unlike what the prayer says at the start of each day in Parliament, setting aside all personal and private interest. Uh, actually, Labour is now beholden to a relatively narrow part of their own caucus who set the agenda at basically any cost, not just political cost to Labour, but cost to New Zealand's constitutional arrangements. Mm. Look, David, finally, this is probably the last time we're chatting uh, this year on the platform. I would first like to thank you for being available uh, to us, and, and not all politicians, though an increasing no number, are. How would you rate uh, your year, and more importantly, your caucuses and parties' year, uh, out of 10 in terms of your performance and where you end up as we head off for the Christmas break? Oh, look, we'd, we'd probably give it a seven. Um, so answer your question. Uh, the thing I'm most proud of is that X polling has held up. It's almost exactly where it was 12 months ago, and that was a high number then that people thought we'd never achieve. Um, but what's different this year is I think it's more an achievement of the whole caucus. So people are seeing more and more of our other MPs. You've had fewer of them on, on your show. Um, so it's the fact that ACT is growing into, you know, more than one person into a wider caucus. That That's what I'm particularly proud of. But I say it's a seven because, you know, there's 12 months to go. We have to win and we can't just point out difficulties with the government, which are considerable. We also need to ensure that we show New Zealand is a better way forward to get inflation under control, to get law and order back on the streets and in people's shops and homes. Uh, we need to show that there's a way New Zealand can actually see the treaty as something that unites us under liberal democracy rather than something that continually divides us. So we need to show that way forward uh, so that the change of government doesn't just become Labour with blue paint, but actually delivers real change. Um, and can I just finish by the, you might have just heard the bell, just finish yeah, by I saying good on you guys. You, you're doing a great job. Um, and I'm proud that, if I remember rightly, I was the first politician to come on you the You were indeed. Uh, and, it's, and it's good to see a few others following. Good on you, David. Um, we might see you tonight for a bevy, uh, or not a bevy in your case, uh, at the Gallery Christmas Party. I'll let you go and vote or do whatever the bells are calling you to do. That is the ACT, uh, Party, right, leader, uh, Act Party leader, David Seymour. And a bit of, I guess, end of year interview. And he was. He was the first uh, politician to come on the platform. I had forgotten that. Clearly he hasn't because it's so important, the platform. Jeez, we've come away, haven't we?